Hi everyone, thank you for taking the time today to listen into this webinar on narrow vein modeling workflows in Leapfrog Geo. My name is Zoe Reed Lindrews and I'm one of the geologists in Sequence Perth office. Sequent has a range of software offerings for use throughout the exploration and mining value chain. Today we'll focus on functionality within Leapfrog Geo with a brief glimpse of Sequent Central. The key aims of this session are to run through how to create a narrow vein or a narrow vein system in Leapfrog Geo, how this fits in with a broader workflow which can be modified to suit project needs and can be applied to exploration, open pit or underground projects. During this session, I will touch on a few things. We'll briefly have a look at basic table and column setup and interval selection for narrow veins. And just a note here, when we talk about veins in Leapfrog, these can be any planar domains with hanging wall and foot wall contacts. For example, a vein in Leapfrog could be a sill or a dike, it could actually be a vein, or perhaps a fault zone. We'll look at advanced vein modelling tips and how to manually adjust a vein reference surface. We'll also look at some other parts of the vein, including pinch outs and vein boundaries. Then we'll move on to the economic compositing tool and how to build a domain from these economic intervals. And we'll also take a quick look at indicator interpolants and how these can be used as a guide for more detailed domaining using the vein tool or can be used to help define high and low grade areas within a vein domain. In terms of the overall narrow vein workflow, here's an example for a generic underground mine. However, this could be modified to suit any stage of project. In Leapfrog, there isn't really a one-size-fits-all workflow solution. The workflow needs to suit the specific project aims and required outputs. In this generic workflow, the overall workflow starts off with importing data and fixing errors. On the top row, we've listed some importing and data checking stages. These could be things such as reloading ore, fault and lithology pickups from survey data, reloading or loading planar structural data, and importing georeferenced face photos and level maps and visually validating these. The second row then works on updating the geological model and structural framework before moving on to updating the mineralization model and allowing everything to reprocess. So during this update, we would look at updating faults, barren lithology models and other geology shapes. We'd also update interval selections for loads on a merge table in the drill hole data folder, update category selections on mapped points for load hanging wall and foot wall contacts, and then allow the interval selection and other saved objects to reprocess and dynamically update the vein system. The bottom row then includes further validation steps to ensure the model is matching the data and our geological interpretation as planned. We've then included some export steps to make sure that the interval selection column and any other relevant information created within Leapfrog is stored outside of the Leapfrog Geo project in a database. Today we won't run through this whole workflow in detail, but we'll focus on the step of manually editing the veins as required to fit our data and interpretation. Let's now jump into Leapfrog Geo. Throughout the demo, I'm going to make use of saved scenes to bring up relevant data and locations. And I'll utilize a couple of different data sets in order to demonstrate key functionality within Leapfrog. The data in this first example project comes from an underground silver mine. However, the workflows will be very similar for gold, silver, nickel, and any other narrow vein or shear hosted commodities. The data set for this project includes a topographic surface created from points. We have drill hole data, including surface drill holes, underground drill holes, and underground face chip samples. Here we're showing lithology data. 
We also have assay data. Right now we are taking a look at silver assays. And we have an existing fault mesh and mineralized domains. So here we have a large fault running through the middle of the project, um, truncating some of these mineralized domains. To set this project up, I initially built the existing wireframes into a geological model as intrusions from surface. This can be done for any valid closed meshes. To do this, make sure you have the meshes in the meshes folder and that they don't have any exclamation points showing that they're invalid. Then set up a geological model. Add the meshes into the lithologies tab. So whatever lithologies you need to correspond to the meshes, I've added in here. Can then right click on the surface chronology and add in a new intrusion from surface and select any valid mesh from the meshes folder and set up the inside and outside lithology for each of those. So I've added in these veins as intrusions from surface and activated them to create output volumes. These output volumes can then be evaluated back against the drill holes. To evaluate a model against the drill holes, right click on the drill holes and choose this new evaluation option. Any of the models can then be back flagged, creating a new table. This evaluation table contains all of the drill hole intervals which fall inside or outside these existing domains. So we can see the drill hole ID, the from and the to, and then which domain that interval falls within. This evaluation table was then added to a merge table with the assay and lithology data. To create a new merge table, right click on the drill holes and select new merge table. Any available intervals can then be brought across. In this case, I have some assay information, lithology and the back flagged geology model. This evaluation table can be really useful. It allows us to take a look at statistics for each of the existing domains and can also be used to select intervals which fall within those specific wireframes so that we can rebuild the model into a live leapfrog model. We have a blog on how to do this back flagging and rebuilding. If anyone would like to the link to this blog, please get in touch with your local support team and we can point you in the right direction. I mentioned that with these evaluated tables, we can get a look at statistics. So in the, the evaluated table has been added into this merge table, can then right click and select statistics, table of statistics. My level one category is the back flagged model and I'm looking at silver assays and grouping by numeric item. Can then sort by mean and get a really quick idea about the grades that fall within these different domains. So we can see that Alphen South has a mean silver grade of 201 and middle marks only at 71. We can take a look at this as a box plot as well to get a nice visual representation of the grades of those different domains. So these vein domains were recreated within a dynamic leapfrog geo model and edited as required. To set that up, let's take a look in the project tree at how it was set up. So our mineralization model, the lithologies link back to the min selection. So this is an interval selection that I set up on the merge table. That interval selection links back to a silver category, which links back to the silver category on the assay table. That finally links back to the original silver assays. This category from numeric column can be useful to bend numeric data into categories and build a model from the resulting categorical data. It's generally how we'd 
model veins which need to snap to assay or sample intervals rather than to lithological intervals. You might also notice that I've set up the interval selection on a merge table. So back down in our merge table, my min selection is the interval selection for rebuilding the veins. Doing it this way provides more flexibility around which intervals are available to snap and select. So here in the drop down, any of the intervals that I've added into my merge table can be selected while I'm editing and can then be swiped over to add them into a particular domain. This is just one way to create veins. Veins in LeapFrog Geo can be created from lithology data or any other categorical data. Using the category from numeric as a base column for the interval selection is what I've done in this example, and it may or may not be suitable for your deposit and your project. Veins can also be created from GIS data, point data, and or polylines. And veins can have multiple different data sources. For example, if drill hole data and mapped points are available, these could be used within the same vein. And interpretation polylines could then also be added. Let's take a look at veins in the project tree. So we'll head back down to the geological models folder and we'll take a look at the metal mark vein. But let's first look at how we originally built that vein. So we set up a new geological model and chose the interval selection, the min selection as the base lithology column for that model and set the boundary extents to the desired area that enclosed the relevant data. And we set the surface resolution to something sensible. In this case, let's see what we did. I think it was around 10 because we have some quite closely spaced data. Our lithology is now linked to the min selection. To build a new vein, we'd come to the surface chronology in either the north or south fault block in this example and right click on the surface chronology to create a new vein from base lithology. So this is going to be looking back to our min selection column to build those veins. If we wanted to build the veins from other contacts, we can select from other contacts and then choose whichever other interval information we'd like to use. We could also set up a new vein from polylines from GIS vector data or from points. And there's an option to set up a new vein system as well. So a new vein will just be an individual vein and won't be talking to any of the other veins around it. A new vein system has an internal lithology, so for example, mineralization, because I'm going to model all of the mineralized veins in this vein system. And that's the way that I've set it up in this project here. So we've got the vein system. And the main difference here is that within a vein system, we can set terminations. Individual veins, we can sort of manually terminate against one another using boundaries, which we'll look at a bit later. But the vein system allows us to set up multiple veins with different relative ages. So the youngest vein will be highest and the oldest will be the lowest in this vein priority. And here I've set up the streak vein terminates against the foot wall of metal mark and terminates against the hanging wall of the skipper. So let's take a look at what that looks like in the scene view. So the streak vein is this little yellow one in here, and we can see that it's terminating against the foot wall of the middle mark and against the hanging wall of the skipper. And this is a dynamic relationship. So anytime I update the middle mark or the skipper, it will also update the streak. 
And so that's the main benefit of using a vein system over individual veins. One thing to take note is that there will only be one output volume for the entire mineralized system. But if you are doing estimation using LeapFrog Edge, the individual veins can be chosen as domains. Here we're taking a look at metal mark. We can see if we expand the vein out that it's made up of a hanging wall and foot wall. The vein segments, vein pinch outs, a vein reference surface and the vein boundary. We'll take a look at all of these components in a bit more detail. If we expand these out further, we can see what input data goes into each of these. So if I expand out the hanging wall, I get these hanging wall points. If I expand out those hanging wall points, they hyperlink back to the vein segments. The vein segments then hyperlink back up to our min selection as we saw before. Additional data can be added into the vein hanging wall or foot wall by right clicking and selecting one of these options. So I can right click on the hanging wall and add points, GIS vector data or polylines, or I can edit and digitize a polyline directly within that hanging wall surface. So I'll just grab my next saved scene. And we'll take a look at drawing a polyline in the vein hanging wall. So right click on the hanging wall and edit. Grab my polyline drawing tool. And let's say my interpretation is that the vein should be a little bit thicker here where it's pinching out. I can draw a polyline edit in. And as soon as I hit save, the vein will reprocess and update. So now the vein's slightly thicker there. So you can see this polyline that I've just digitized isn't hyperlinked, so it's only existing within the hanging wall. And if I delete out the middle mark vein, I will lose this polyline with it as well. So I can right click and share that polyline and it then copies it up into the polylines folder and it's hyperlinked up there. I can then remove it without deleting it if I want to. If I decide that that interpretation wasn't quite right and I want to try out a different one, it gives me the flexibility of removing it without deleting it. And I know that I can add it back in again from the polylines folder. And the vein has automatically reprocessed. So if I want it back again, I'll just add a polyline. And well, which one was it? Click OK and it'll automatically reprocess. While that's processing, we'll take a look at how to add points to a vein hanging wall or foot wall. So this is a workflow that I like to use for underground mapping points, but it could be for any kind of mapped points, whether it's in pit surface exploration mapping or underground face and back mapping. So in this case, rather than digitizing polylines in LeapFrog, I have a mapping pickup from Survey. And I like to bring it in as points. That way, this points file can just be appended to or reloaded as needed. And I can have one master mapping file if I wanted to. Can then use a category selection. So Let's take a look in the scene view. So I've got these mapped points in my drive. And we'll just cut a slice at the same RL there and look down. So I've got my vein here in blue, my face chip samples in a turquoise colour, and then the mapped points are here as well. Using the category selection on the points, I can select the points that I'd like to add to either the hanging wall or foot wall. 
In this case, these are the hanging wall ones. So I've assigned these to the hanging wall, assign these other points to the foot wall, and hit save. These can then be pulled out of the master file with a new selection and a query filter. So I've done that here. I've got the foot wall and the hanging wall have been pulled out and they have a little funnel on, to, on them to show that they're filtered data. Come back down to the vein in the project tree. So this one is the Elf and South. And I've already added those points into the hanging wall. And to check that those are snapped, I'll make the hanging wall visible. And we can see that there is a vertex where each one of those points is. So we can tell that the surface has snapped to those mapping points. The foot wall, however, we haven't snapped yet. So let's do that now. So I've got these foot wall points and we don't have a vertex in the mesh at each of those points. So right click on the Elf and South foot wall, add points and select the Elf and South foot wall points and click OK. The vein will then dynamically update and reprocess to honor that new input data. So now we have a vertex at each one of those mapped points and we're still honoring our face chip data at the same time. Snap and boundary settings for a vein can be customized. An example of this would be to snap to the drill hole data but use the inter polylines or points as a guide, or to snap to drill holes and mapping data but have additional polylines as a guide based on interpretation. So let's take a look at changing snap settings. So again, we'll have a look at the Alpha and South. I'll double click on the Elf and South surface and come to the surfacing tab. At the moment, we are snapped to all data, but I can change that to drilling only if I only wanted to snap to drilling or to custom. So I'll change that to custom and come across to the inputs tab. So we can see that we have two different data inputs into both the hanging wall and foot wall. We have the points which are made from the drill hole segments from the interval selection and we have these mapping points that I've just added in now. We could choose to just use these mapping points as an influence but snap to the drill holes so let's give that a go. So now we're still, the vein is still being influenced by these points however it isn't snapped to them. These snap settings can be changed whenever you like, so if you add in new interpretation polylines or any other data, you can choose if you'd like to snap to that data or not. The boundary filter of a vein can also be customised. So again, that's back in the vein. So double-clicking on the vein in the project tree, come to the surfacing tab and take a look at this boundary filter here. It can be customised if needed. So this is talking about what happens when data objects are added to a surface and how they're going to be treated when they lie outside of that surface's boundary. So there are two different options. One is filtering the data. So that would be all data we can have or drilling only. The surface is then only influenced by the data that falls inside that surface's boundary. Another option would be to turn the boundary filter off. The surface is then influenced by data both inside and outside the surface's boundary. An example of when you might want to turn the boundary filter off is if there is a fault block in the project that's chopping the vein up. Um, and in this case, we're assuming that the fault is post-mineralization and should be offsetting the veins. However, there may be some cases where veins are younger than the fault and shouldn't be offset. This occurs in many Western Australian gold mines where proterozoic dolerite dikes are modeled as veins in leapfrog. Turning the boundary filter off 
for these younger features will allow the vein to see data on either side of that fault block boundary and essentially unfault the vein. Another example of when you might like to turn the boundary filter off is if you'd put in interpretation control lines to change the geometry of the vein, but these lines lie above the topography surface. Turning the boundary filter off will allow the vein to see those polylines above the topo. Um, we'll go back to looking at our metal mark vein now. So I'll just come to my next saved scene. We'll take a look at the vein segments now. These are the next things down in the project tree below the hanging wall and footwall inside a vein. These can be edited by right clicking on the segments in the project tree and choosing edit in scene or by toggling the pencil tool in the shape list on and off. If I'm modeling a vein and it isn't doing what I want or it's full of holes, these segments are usually the first thing I look at. Sometimes the default hanging wall and footwall assignments aren't correct. And this is particularly the case for vertical or sub-vertical veins and, and for drill holes, which are at a very low angle to a vein. To edit these segments, as mentioned, click on the pencil tool. We'll then see in the scene view that all of the hanging wall segments are red and all of the foot wall segments are blue. I can choose any one of these and change that assignment if it's wrong or if I want to force the vein to pinch out in that particular location, I can always also use these segments to do that. So to edit any of these, I'll click on that segment in the scene view. I'll just jump into a slice view. It'll be a little bit easier to see what we're looking at. Um, so here are our vein segments. And when I hit edit, can select any one of these segments and see point A and B are labeled in the scene view. These correspond to point A and B in the vein segment orientations editing window, which pops up. If I want to, I can untick the auto assignment and either exclude that segment and it'll turn gray in the scene view and won't be snapped to or won't be used in that vein. Or I can swap the automatic orientations if Leap Frog hasn't quite got it right, or if I want to force a pinch out in that particular location. So swapping them and hitting save is going to force the hanging wall and foot wall to cross over one another, and we won't get vein volume then in that particular location. So just wait a sec for that to process. So we can see there that that has forced the vein to pinch out at that location there. And that's because the hanging wall and foot wall surfaces are crossing over one another. So if you really need to define where a vein pinches out, it can be a good idea to select an interval on that drill hole, but then flip the hanging wall and foot wall by editing these vein segment orientations. Pinch outs can also be turned on for the whole vein. To turn them on, double click on the vein and go to the surfacing tab and tick this pinch out box. What this will do is similar to what we just did with the hanging wall and footwall segments. It's going to flip the vein hanging wall and footwall anywhere that we haven't selected, in this case the metal mark vein, and it will force a pinch out in that location. This can be a really good check to see where you haven't updated the drill holes yet or where you don't have sufficient grade and haven't selected an interval on those particular drill holes. So taking a look in the scene view, we can see there's a big hole in our vein where we just flipped the hanging wall and foot wall segments. So I'll just hide those. We've also got these three pink 
intervals, and these represent where the vein has continued through a drill hole, but the metal mark vein hasn't been selected. At the moment, the pinch outs are still inactive, but I've just ticked pinch out and I'll click OK. So that'll update the vein surface automatically to honor those pinch outs. I can now go and check the drill holes at this location to see if the vein should be selected and updated, or I can manually edit these pinch outs to exclude some of them if I would like the vein to be continuous across these drill holes. Normally, um, in a situation where I might do this is if I had a whole fan of holes, but only one of them didn't have that vein logged or selected, then maybe I'd exclude a pinch out. But otherwise, it might be prudent to just leave them. So let's take a look. We've got a fan here, but this particular hole hasn't had the middle mark selected. So I'm just going to edit that pinch out. So I'll click on the pencil in the shape list. Click on the pinch chart in the scene view, and then I can exclude that particular one. It'll turn gray, and as soon as I hit save, the vein will update again and ignore that pinch chart. We've still got a hole because of this other one we flipped, so let's flip that back. Go back to auto and hit save. Once this is processed, we're going to move on and take a look at the vein reference surface. So that's updated now, and we can see our vein hanging wall and footwall segments are back in the right orientation and we've ignored this one pinch out here but we're still honoring these other two so we've got a hole in our vein there but that's okay we'll leave them for now. The next object down in the project tree is the vein reference surface so I'll double click on that to get some options. The default reference surface in LeapFrog is a curved reference surface. This is a best fit plane based on the midpoints of the input intervals. So it takes all of these input intervals and pulls out the midpoints and makes a best fit plane for those. Additional data can be added to a curved reference surface to edit its geometry and influence the vein. This can be done by right clicking in the project tree on the reference surface and adding either points, GIS vector data or polylines, or a polyline can be drawn directly into the reference surface, the same as with the hanging wall and foot wall. The second option is a planar reference surface. So this is a user defined plane and will force the vein to fit the surface away from data. This can work really well for planar features. Here in the scene view, we can see a plane with H for hanging wall and F for foot wall. And I can adjust that as needed to best fit those segments that I've got. And this is a pretty planar feature, so it would work well having a planar reference surface. So I'll click OK there. When new data is added to a vertical or sub-vertical vein, sometimes the reference surface can flip based on this new information. And you might get the foot wall on the wrong side um, and it may cause some issues where manual edits have been made to the vein with polylines and points. So a quick way to fix this if that happens is to right click on the reference surface in the project tree and flip the orientation of it. So the planar reference surface is pretty simple. You can't really edit it, it's just a best fit plane. But we'll take a bit more of a look at a curved reference surface. And in this case, I'm going to try out an alternative interpretation for the Alphen vein. So at the moment, it's modeled as faulted, and I'm going to have a go at modeling it as folded. So this is the original Elfin 
north and Alphen south. So we've got two different domains with a fault running down, cutting them up. And I've got this alternative interpretation to try out where I'm going to model it as a curve and have the fold hinge where the fault is going through. So first up, I need to get rid of the fault. So to do this in the project tree, I've just made a copy of the mineralization model and tried out a few different hypotheses. So here I've unfaulted the Elfin vein and I've drawn some polylines that I think match the new fold interpretation, but I haven't added them to this vein surface or reference surface yet. So you can see that vein, as soon as it gets away from data, is trying to go back towards the planar reference surface. So what I've done then is added those polylines into the reference surface and forced the vein volume to come around that curve. So to do this, find the vein in the project tree and expand it out right click on the reference surface and I added polylines in there. At the moment, the midpoints are still being used in this iteration of the vein. So if we take a look at the vein reference surface, we can see it's curved. We've got the midpoints and we have the polylines that I've drawn in. The next thing I've done is removed the midpoint. So this is the last iteration here. So to take a look at this one, we'll go back to the project tree and expand it out. And in this reference surface, I'm just using the polylines and I've unticked the midpoints. In this case, it isn't very different from when I've used the midpoints. So we'll just toggle back and forth quickly. So that's with midpoints and polylines, and then this one is with polylines only. So it's pretty similar. However, in some cases, it might make quite a big difference. The main situation where I would set the reference surface up in this way with polylines only would be if the vein is folded and also has intervals that are internal to the vein, things like face chip or trench samples. And the vein is also wider than the sample length of those face chips or trenches. Because if this is the case, the midpoints can cause issues as they may actually be near one of the vein contacts rather than in the middle of the domain. The next thing we'll take a look at is the final object within the vein surface in the project tree, the vein boundary. We'll just drag that on. So the vein boundary allows you to specify the extents of the vein volume because by default veins in LeapFrog extend all the way to the edge of the model. So adding a boundary polyline in will clip the vein volume to inside this polyline. There are a couple of things to keep in mind when drawing a boundary polyline in a vein. One, the boundary polyline needs to be a closed polyline and not have any self-intersections. And the other thing to remember is that the polyline is drawn in 2D on the vein boundary plane. And this isn't necessarily the reference surface plane. So we can check what that vein boundary plane is up to by, let me just get the right one in the project tree, by right clicking on the vein boundary in the project tree and we can adjust that plane. So we can see F and B for front and back. And because this is drawn in 2D, sometimes for curved veins, you might just need to get a best fit. I'll just adjust that there and click OK. Sometimes you might find that the plane is really in completely the wrong orientation. So it might the way out. The orientation is usually only this bad if the vein was initially built from two segments. 
because this doesn't provide enough information to set the plane in 3D in a good orientation. So if that happens, just come in and adjust the vein boundary plane before drawing in the polyline boundary. So I've got that on there now. The plane's in the right orientation and I can edit the boundary. So I can move the polyline, I could select all and delete it out and redraw it in if I wanted to. So I'll just quickly redraw. So it just needs to be closed and continuous and not have any self-intersections. Could make it all curved if I want to and adjust the geometry as needed before hitting save and it will update. If modeling for resource reserve reporting rather than for exploration, we may need to limit the vein extents a bit further and make sure that extra volume isn't modeled. So for example, I might not want to model any more than 80 meters away from a nearest data point. In LeapFrog, distance functions can be really useful for this. So a distance buffer can be made around the drill holes or around the midpoints of the vein intervals and can be used in this situation to help guide the vein boundary polyline location. So I'll just grab my next scene view. And in a sec, I'll show you how to set up a distance buffer. But here we can see that distance function evaluated onto the vein surface showing these different distance buffers. Yellow is 80 to 120 meters away, and then orange is greater than 120 meters. These numeric models or distance functions can be set up in the numeric models folder by right clicking and choosing new distance function. The objects can then be selected. In this case, I chose the metal mark midpoints, which I'd extracted from my drill table. And I've set one up here, so we'll take a look. The objects that we're creating the distance buffers around are the middle mark midpoints. And in the buffers tab, I've set up buffers at 20, 40, 80, and 120 meters away from those midpoints. This distance function can then be evaluated onto the metal mark surface. So that's just right clicking on the vein surface and going to evaluations. And then I've brought across the distance to middle mark midpoints over to the selected side and click OK. Then in the shape list, the distance to middle mark midpoints is available in the drop down. And I've set up a new discrete color map just to show you those distances that I'm interested in. Then looks like this. So I've got my vein boundary in the scene view and I can edit that boundary and just adjust my vein, my vein boundary, so that I'm not getting too far away from my closest data point. And I'll just bring in this bottom bit here a little bit. And as soon as I hit save, the vein will dynamically update again. And I've clipped out the volume that was greater than 80 meters away. We've taken a pretty good look at veins in the project tree. We've looked at hanging wall and foot wall edits the vein segments, we've looked at pinch outs and reference surfaces and the vein boundary. So next up, we're gonna jump into a second project and take a look at economic compositing. I'll open up this one here. This project is a BIF hosted gold deposit and has been modeled as a vein system here in pink. 
So here we've got the vein system in pink and the assay data. So I'm just going to jump into a section view so we can have a quick look at it. So here's our assay information and the vein system that's been modelled is outlined in pink. Another way to model this might be to set up the economic composite and build an intrusion around the OR intervals. Economic compositing in LeapFrog Geo is used to create OR and waste intervals based on a cutoff grade and other user-defined parameters. The economic compositing functionality can be found in the composites folder in the drill hole data folder. To create a new one, just right click and choose new economic composite. I've got one here already, so we'll have a quick look at that. To edit it, I'll just right click on the table and choose Edit Economic Composited Table. This tool allows factors to limit or allow dilution of the given comp run and can account for planar true thickness if desired. The purpose is to create comps that can then be used as a guide for economic material or can be modelled as a surface based on mineability parameters in addition to a cutoff grade. This can be really useful when the geology is poorly understood or geology doesn't show a strong control on mineralisation or, for example, when only assay information is available. If you'd like some more detailed information about the settings in the economic compositing tool and what the impacts of changing each of these settings are, please let us know after the webinar and we'll get back to you with more information. In this case, we're going with a basic dilution rule. There are some advanced and advanced plus rules that can be used. We've set the cutoff grade to 0.5 with a minimum or composite length of 2. I've set my max included waste to 2 and my max consecutive waste to 1. There are a couple of other options here that I haven't utilised, but they are explained in a document. Um, if you'd like it, please get in touch. So what that gives us, if we look in the scene view, are all of our drill holes split into either or or waste based on those parameters. So just edit colours, so we're just looking at the OR. So all of these red intervals are defined as OR based on those cutoff grades and parameters that I set up. And each interval will give us a bunch of information, including the FROM and TO, the gold grade or whatever assay you're doing your comp on, the dilution grade, the length of the dilution within that interval, the linear grade of the interval itself, so if you're in Australia, this is going to be gram meters. The percentage of missing intervals or missing samples, what its status is and what its length is. So we get some good information out of there. The next thing that we could do with this is build a domain based on these economic intervals. So I've modeled it as an intrusion. And you can see I've done a reasonably good job lining up and connecting all of these OR intervals. Um, and our next Technical Tuesday is going to run through intrusion editing and how to control and edit an intrusion surface. So I won't go too much into that there. I'll just say I've added a structural trend to the intrusion. And in section view, we'll take a look at it against the vein model. And we can see that it fits reasonably well. It isn't as continuous as the vein system model is. So if I scroll through, so the intrusion is here in solid red and the vein outline is in pink. You can see it fits reasonably well. And it may be suitable for some deposits, so it's a good option to keep in mind. Another tool within LeapFrog which can be useful to guide the interpretation of vein systems is the indicator interpolant. So indicator interpolants are another kind of numeric model. 
so they can be set up in the numeric models folder by right clicking and choosing new indicator RBF interpolant. So an indicator interpolant in LeapFrog is a numeric model that makes volumes to encompass values which are either inside or outside of a designated cutoff grade. The input values are converted to 0 or 1, depending on if they fall inside or outside of the cutoff value. And an ISO surface is then built at a value in between 0 and 1. And by default, this is sent to, set to 0 0.5, indicating where the probability of the grade being higher than the cutoff is 50%. The ISO value can be changed to create more generous or more conservative shapes. So the settings in an indicator interpolant. And take a really quick look here. So our cutoff grade is set in this cutoff. So I've set mine to 0 0.5, but it would be whatever is statistically reasonable for your deposit. A trend can be applied and I've applied a structural trend to this one. And then the volumes give us the ISO value, which is the probability, and the surface resolution. Another handy setting here is discarding volume parts smaller than a certain number of units so that we don't end up with a whole bunch of tiny little bubbles around discontinuous grade. Take a look at those indicator interpolants. So the one we're looking at the moment is a 0.5 gram cutoff at a 50% or a 0.5 ISO value. So we're saying that everything inside this shape is likely, has a 50% chance of being inside our cutoff and everything outside of that shape is outside our cutoff. If we take a look at the values that are building that surface, just turn the labels off can see all of the red values are inside, the green values are at the contact, and the blue values are outside. And if I label them, they're essentially just zeros and ones rather than the grades themselves. They're either above or below. So we'll jump back to looking at the assay information. I've also built a 0 0.3 and 0 0.7 ISO value indicator interpolant for the same data. So here's the 0 0.3 in green, and it's a lot more generous because it's a 30% probability that we're inside. And then the 0 0.7 there in blue is a lot more conservative because it's a 70% probability that we're inside. So it's, I guess we have a higher confidence that we're inside the indicator interpolant for that 0 0.7. If we compare that to the loads, I'll just hide the 0.3. I think we have a decent correlation between the manually picked veins and where the indicator interpolant is showing us that we're above our 0.5 cutoff. So this can be a handy tool to use to help guide interval selection to build a vein system. And it can also be really useful to show inside a domain where we might be expecting areas of high or low grade. So I'll just show you how to do that. I'll make a copy of the 0.5 ISO value. And we're going to call this one clipped. In the boundary, I can then Add in a new lateral extent from surface. And I'm going to choose the vein system from my geological model. For full transparency, that process of clipping the indicator interpolant took five minutes because um, I have a pretty fine surface resolution. But we can now see inside the vein system, 
The red is where we have a 50% probability of being above our cutoff. And then the blue areas are where we are 50% probability of outside that 0.5 cutoff. Thank you all very much for listening into this webinar. I hope there were some valuable tips for vein modelling, as well as an introduction to economic compositing and indicator interpolants. A good understanding of all the tools available in LeapFrog will help to set up robust workflows for your project, and ensuring that the project is well set up at the beginning with an understanding of the requirements downstream will make modelling a lot easier. For guidance with this, or for other support questions, please reach out to the skilled Secret Geos in your region. Here are the support emails. I'll just leave that up there for a minute, um, just so that anyone can write them down if they need to. And once again, thanks very much for listening into the webinar. Please pass it along if you know anyone else who could benefit from it or might be interested.